you. Good morning. So this is the last day of this school and uh, of my lectures. So let us continue our discussion about uh, gauge supergravities. We started yesterday uh, discussing uh, <coughs> about the construction of gauge supergravity, gauge extended supergravity. We focused on uh, four dimensional extended theories. We've seen what we have done. We started from an ungauged equal four. Uh, and very for the to model. Okay? In a specific Lagrangian representation, this means uh, in a specific <coughs> symplectic frame. You know, we have seen that the Lagrangian representation is not unique for a gain and a gain supergravity in four dimensions. That depends on the symplectic frame which is namely how what we define an electric and what we define magnetic. Like Right? So we fixed an electric frame, so a symplectic frame. <coughs> we fixed a symplectic frame and wrote the symplectic vector of a free strength and their magnetic dual, labeling them by Hattelin indices, right? At lambda hat mm -hmm. G lambda hat mm. Okay. Then we know symplectic frame is Lagrangian description, okay, with a specific subgroup of the global symmetry group, okay, which describes the global symmetries of the Lagrangian. Okay. Once we choose a symplectic frame, we choose also the Lagrangian and its global symmetries. Then we took a subgroup of GP and promoted it to local, sim to local symmetry groups of the, of the action. Okay? And then, so we ended up with an action which we called LG, G not local invariant of the G, but unfortunately not super symmetric. Then, we discussed how to uh, complement this new Lagrangian with the uh, extra terms. G is the overall coupling constant. Of order G and of order G squared. Right, so one, two. Such so that the resulting Lagrangian is invariant, so is invariant, supersymmetry invariant, provided invariant under the same amount of supersymmetry of the original Gates theory, this was the, the, the condition, okay, provided we also uh, modify the Specific transformations of the Fermi in a suitable way. Under the uh, isotropic group of the scalar band 
which is the maximal compact setting of our of our um, uh, global symmetry machine. Okay. Now, what is the general form of H in an extended supergravity? H as this form is the product of a, a factor which I would call H out automorphism times H matter. Okay? H automorphism is the automorphism group of the superalgebra, which the whole supergravity is based on, which is super concave. So this is the so-called asymmetry. So H out is equal to UN for N less than 8 SUN for N equal 8. Okay? And it acts on the, as we said at the beginning, it acts on the indices A, B, C. Okay? Labeling the supersymmetry generators. H matter is a, a factor, is a, a part of the isotropy group which acts on the matter fields. The vector matter for instance, okay? Or hyper matter fields, in case of any position. Okay, so this is the general structure that came out. Uh, and as we emphasize, fermion fields don't feel A, the G don't transform directly under G, but they transform under the compensating transformation in H. So if we perform a transformation in G on the whole theory, bosonic fields do transform directly under G under this transformation, while Fermi fields transform only under the, comp the corresponding compensating transformation in H. The Fermi fields always feel the symmetry of the point, and just the symmetry of the point. Okay. What we want to do today, so we, we also wrote a number of consistency conditions that uh, our gauge, our gauge group should satisfy in order to be a viable gauge group, okay? We wrote omega mu at the gauge connection as G A mu lambda hat x lambda hat, where these are the gauge generators, right? The gauge group is x uh, psi lambda hat x lambda hat, okay? So we found a number of constraints which can be grouped in a first class of constraints which are linear in the gauge generators. Yes. 
Okay. Can we reformulate these constraints? That is, the constraints on uh, uh, consistent gauges in a, a form which does not depend on our initial choice of electric frame. Okay? This is the, the point we will, this is the, the property now we want to address. Here you see all these constraints, they are uh, written in the electric frame. That is in our, the frame we started from. Now, can we reformulate this constraint, constraints on variable gauges, in such a way that no reference is made to any particular reference frame, simple frame, okay? Uh, this means writing them in a manifestly G-covariant way. G, I mean, covariant with respect to the full global symmetry. Okay. This can be done, and this is what we are going to do now. And it will bring us, it will, it will, uh, um, um, it will uh, lead us to the definition of the so-called embedding tensor as a, a G covariant. Okay, so what we're going to do is the following. So let us define in our in our um, uh, symplectic frame, in the electric symplectic frame, a symplectic vector of gauge generators, which consists of our gauge generators, okay, and some magnetic generators, which in our case are simple. But we are just including them in order to be able to write a symplectic vector of generators. Okay? So that we can write, we can define a symplectic vector of vector fields consisting of the electric vector fields which are described in, within our Lagrangian locally, uh, a fundamental field, and some new vectors, which are the magnetic fields, which simply do not appear in our field. So that, you see, we can write our gauge connection as G, A mu M, Xn, that is G, a mu lambda x lambda plus a mu lambda x lambda. But this is zero, so this is not but g a mu lambda x lambda. So we really haven't done anything. Okay, just added this term which is zero. But this allows us now to recast all the relations that we wrote in a, a symplectic covariant form, okay? In particular, encoding our initial choice of symplectic frame in a symplectic matrix. <coughs> so let us introduce a symplectic matrix which I denote by E. And let us encode our initial choice of the symplectic frame in this matrix, which relates our initial symplectic frame. Sorry. Is this equivalent to putting the electrical part and the magnetic part on the same footing? Is that what you essentially do? Uh, that's what we are going to do. Okay. Yes, yes, precisely. All right. So here they are not on the same footing because one appears in the Lagrangian, the other is not. Right. Do not. Does not. Okay. But now this is what we want to do. I see. Okay. So. Let us introduce now a symplectic matrix with the first index in the, our original uh, symplectic frame, the second index in a, a generic symplectic frame. This is in uh, SP 2 and 1, and 1 is the number of vector fields, R. Okay? And then write X, M as E, M, M. X, N. So now we 
define a vector of generators okay, in a generic symplectic frame. We are changing our symplectic frame by means of a symplectic matrix. Okay? So we are changing what we call electric and what we call magnetic. That's all. So if we write this explicitly, we see that we are expressing at our gauge generators as a combination, which are we call them electric gauge generators. Okay? It's a combination of uh, some electric, new electric gauge generators and magnetic, which are we see on a, on an equal footing, written like this. Okay. Clearly, now we have uh, at least twice as many generators formally. Okay as uh, the vector fields of the theory, okay? So that is a bit of a problem. There's a clear redundancy. Because these uh, gauge, new gauge generators are not independent, since we have the other condition, which follows from this one, which is E lambda, uh, lambda, x lambda, plus E lambda, x. So clearly, this poses a condition, which implies simply that only, at most, a uh, number n1 of generator generators is a linear independent, okay? So it's involved in it. Now, that this allows us to revise the uh, gauge connection in a symplectic invariant way. <laughs>
I'm going to write the duality action of this new array of generators in the new frame, okay? That is what we call R1 of Xm. The action of these generators on the vector field strengths in their magnetic tool, but in the new frame, okay? So this is the matrix that we have this index function, okay? You see now, we are considering the action of these generators in the new synthetic frame, labeled by unhalted indices. Well, what's the relation between this and our original generators? The relation uh, uh, goes to the, um, can be written in terms of the matrix E, easy, okay? So, X, M. Let us avoid writing brackets here, okay? So what I, what I mean by this tensor is just this, the matrix form of the gauge generator exam. We write this that like this. This is not in pass. E to the minus one, M, M hat. E to the minus one, M, M hat. X, M hat, M hat. Uh, P hat, E, P hat, P. Okay? So, going to the new frame means rotating, changing all the, the indices from hatted to unhatted by using the matrix C and its inverse, of course. Okay? So, you see now we have to define the tensor, which is manifest in G covariant because it has symplectic indices. As opposed to the tensors that we used yesterday, with hatted lambda, hatted sigma, hatted gamma, hatted green, capital green indices, which were, were not symplectic covariant. Now this is a manifestly symplectic covariant. So, now we want to characterize this, okay, as an element. of uh, the global symmetry algebra of the theory, okay? The global symmetry algebra. So, this has to be contained in GE. However, now we want to formulate conditions on our gauge uh, generators which do not refer to any particular symplectic frame. So, so do not refer to any particular Lagrange and do not refer to any particular global symmetry group of the Lagrange okay? So we want to characterize these as being not, uh, um, as belonging not to the algebra of uh, a uh, so global symmetry group of, us, of some Lagrange, no? But as belonging to the algebra, let's call it like this algebra of the global symmetry group G. Let's call this algebra, well, we have already called this algebra, okay? So this is what we should do now. No more reference to Lagrangians and their global symmetry. So we want to characterize now this XM as elements of G, of the algebra of G. Some notation for describing the algebra of G. Let us denote by T alpha, alpha running from 1 to the dimension of G, the generators of G. Which define a basis of its algebra. And which satisfy the commutation relations with F, alpha, beta, gamma, they have to simplex the structure constants of the global symmetry uh, algebra. Okay? Satisfying the Jacobian entity. Now, each of these generators will have a symplectic representation through R1. So, R1 of T alpha 
describes the duality action, electric magnetic duality action of the generator T alpha as an infinitesimal generator of global symmetry. So this is a matrix which has the structure T alpha and N. Because it acts on the vector of electric field strengths and their magnetic fields. Delta alpha of our vector of electric field strengths and magnetic fields, this is nothing but minus T alpha N M F N. New new. New new. Okay? This is how they act, you see, on the electric field strengths and the magnetic magnetic. Okay? So R1 uh, simply associate, associates with each um, uh, basement generator and a matrix, which is a 2 and 1 times 2 and 1 symplectic matrix, symplectic generator. However, this correspondence R1 is not injected. Okay? So this means that it can have a kernel, a non-trivial kernel. There can be generators, isometric generators in G, which have a trivial uh, duality action on the vector field strengths and their magnetic This is the case of n equal to two theories, and in particular of the isometries of the quaternion theory. Okay, okay, but let's let's get to that later. So this is the general notation. We are not assuming that the kernel that, that this is general. Okay, so some of these matrices may be trivial. Maybe zero. Okay, so uh, these matrices have to be uh, symplectic. So this means that
in the in the two symplectic indices. Once we lower, okay. Okay, this is what we want, I wanted to say about the convention, about the description of uh, the global symmetry group. Now we want to require that Xm belongs to the algebra <laughs> of G. This means that Xm has to be, can be extended in the basis, in the basis the alpha, or any basis of course, of our, of our gauge algebra. Okay? Because it's an element of this algebra, it's a vector space, this means that it can be expanded in any basis we choose for, for this vector space. Okay? And let us denote the coefficient of this expansion by theta. So We see that the requirement that the gate generators in this generic symplectic basis be contained in the global symmetry group generator of the theory, of the engaged theory, leads us to introduce this tensor here, this quantity theta. This is called the embedding tensor. The embedding tensor, as you can see, uh, encodes all, all the information about the choice of the gauge algebra inside the global symmetry algebra. Everything is here. So all information about the gauge is here. Okay? And you see that for the way, well, for the way in which we, we have introduced it, defined it, formally, it is a G covariant tensor. Theta. M alpha is a G covariant tensor. So although it is a non-dynamical tensor, it's made of coupling constant, it's made of structure constant. Formally, I know how to act on it by means of G. Because it belongs to R1, for example, times F joint of G. Okay? So we are encoding all information about our choice of the gauge group in a tensor which is formally at least a covariant with respect to G. Is this clear? Are there are any questions? This is called the embedding tensor. As we shall see now, uh, the various conditions can be uh, consistency conditions of the gauging that we formulated in a specific frame can be recast in this generic range using the uh, theta. Okay? So let us define XMNP as XMN R C R P by lowering the last generated, the last index. Okay? Now you can see, you can easily verify that the linear constraints but that we wrote at the beginning, that is x lambda, <coughs> gamma, sigma, equals zero. x lambda, sigma, gamma, equals zero. And x lambda, sigma, gamma, equals zero. These con constraints, they can be recast in the simple form. In this generic symplectic frame. Okay? You can verify by, by uh, well, simply specializing. This, this is written in, in the generic frame. Well, you, you specialize this in your, the electric frame, what you can get are precisely these conditions. Okay? So they are all included in one. Remember that in the electric frame, this is different from zero, but this is the this is equal to zero. Okay? Okay, then we have the quadratic constraints. 
we change our frame basically expressing to the matrix E uh, the hatted index in terms of unhatted indices and the quadratic constraints related to, to the closure. Now we can, can be written closure of the gate algebra inside the algebra of G. Now can be written this manifest. Now you see, we have uh, uh, twice as many gauge generators okay, as uh, those we, we, we can use. Okay? So there is a clear redundancy. <coughs> there is a clear redundancy. And this is the price we have to pay in order to write uh, these constraints in a G manifesting G covariant way. However, this is not enough because remember we have defined uh, these uh, the generators xm through a symplectic rotation from an electric frame now we want also to uh, encode this condition in a, a condition on theta now we want to write a condition on theta that guarantees that whatever theta i take there exists a matrix e which allows us to rotate to a symplectic frame so to so an electric Okay, so this is called the, the locality condition. <coughs> and it can be recast in this way, in this form. In this symplectic environment form. This is telling us that theta seen as a collection of uh, symplectic vectors labeled by alpha theta m1, theta m2 okay? they are all mutually local this implies this implies well, there is a two way implication the existence of an E M N matrix such that X M uh, equal to E M N X N as only electric component, a non magnetic component. Okay? So, what this condition is telling us is that there is there always exists a symplectic matrix E such that XM hat obtained from XM through the action of E is electric. So there always exists a, a matrix, a symplectic matrix which rotates to a symplectic frame. So sorry, to an electric frame. Hmm? To an electric frame. However, this electric frame, that is this matrix E, depends on theta, clearly. Okay? So, if I choose a, for any uh, embedding tensor solution to these constraints, there's going to be a corresponding electric frame. We're going to name it the electric frame of the embedding tensor. Choosing a different solution, that is a different embedding tensor, we typically end up into a different electric frame. Okay? So the matrix E depends on, on this. The matrix E is, is, is uh, easily constructed starting from this condition here. And we shall show how to do that. Okay? It's not easy to get easily constructed matrix E explicitly, which uh, leads you to the electric frame. Are there questions? So now you see we have one uh, we have one linear constraint which is this one, and we have two quadratic constraints one and two locality constraint. We can rewrite the quadratic constraint. 
mean an equivalent way in terms of theta. You can write it in this equivalent form in terms of that. You can easily check that these two are equivalent. Okay? Now we can, uh, in using this form of the quadratic of this quadratic constraint, we can easily interpret it. Give an interpretation to this quadratic constraint as the condition that the embedding tensor as a G tensor is invariant under the action of the gauge group it defines. So this is a way, a way of interpreting this condition here. Theta is invariant under G. That is the gauge group it is invariant at the G. How to show this? Well, we have to write down the explicit uh, variation of theta with respect to a gauge transformation generated by theta. Okay? So that's the gauge transformation defined by theta. Let us consider an infinitesimal. transformation generated by psi and theta and alpha so let's call it xn okay generated by this and let us compute the variation under this of theta. This is any infinitesimal transformation in case you see under theta. I know how to act by means of this on theta because theta is a G covariant object, so it's covariant with respect to any subgroup, including the region. Okay? So this is uh, air track on these two indices. I first act on the first index. And what I get is minus psi p in the example, okay? x p, beta alpha times theta and beta. You see, I'm, I'm transforming uh, the first index, which is a, a, a contravariant index, in the adjoint representation. Okay, now let's transform the first one. Okay. But now what is this? Xp um, beta gamma is nothing but theta p sigma t sigma definition of x but in the adjoint representation. But t sigma in the adjoint representation is nothing but minus the structure constant. Sigma F sigma beta gamma. Okay? Because the uh, adjunct representation of any generator is just minus the structure constants with the minus. Okay? Okay, so what we end up with is uh, P psi theta m alpha is equal to psi B times theta P sigma uh, theta m beta f sigma beta gamma plus x p m m uh, beta beta m uh, gamma uh, sorry there is another there is another ok 
came up exactly in this year, but I just called it Gamma Delta. Alpha, Alpha. Okay? But this is not too bad. Too bad. So, this is a simple uh, interpretation of the, of the quadratic swing, pretty like that. Theta is to be invited under the action of the gauge group it defines. Okay? Another interpretation is the one. Uh, yeah, but this is uh, one that I read. XP, sorry. XP. Okay? Another interpretation is that the electric magnetic vector fields should transform under the gauge, the, the, the gauge group in its quadrant representation. This is the original uh, interpretation we gave of this signals. Okay. Uh, how about, so we interpreted the, the locality concerning it in terms of the existence for each theta of its own electric frame. Uh, this quadratic constraints we gave an interpretation now. How about the linear constraints? What is the interpretation of the linear constraints? Uh, here, well, um, the interpretation is not straightforward. The interpretation is not straightforward, okay? Um, but you, as you can see, this is a G covariant linear constraint. This means that this is on, on our uh, theta, which is a G covariant object. So this means that uh, um, this is a constraint on the linear representation. And it's telling us the linear representation of G in which theta transforms. This is telling us that theta and alpha should transform in a specific representation, R theta. Okay? So we said that theta uh, transforms in the representation R1 times adjoint of G. Okay, now this product here of representations is in general not irreducible. It will decompose with respect to G. And this will contain a representation of theta plus other representations. What this linear constraints is telling us is that. Theta should be in a particular representation within this decomposition. Not only, but in a particular representation. Now, <clears throat> this, uh, is, this linear constraint is also referred to as a supersymmetry constraint. Uh, well, this is related to the fact that if this constraint were not satisfied, okay, then the cancellations uh, uh, to order G. Um, of the uh, of the supersymmetry variation of our gauge action, uh, which um, um, which involved these uh, Fermi shift uh, tensors and S M, okay, would work. If this condition were not satisfied, our whole construction of the gauge. Uh, Lagrangian, which involved uh, these uh, modifications, these new terms involving these tensors N, S, M, okay, that simply wouldn't work. Wouldn't work for a good theoretical reason, which now I'm going to show. Another way of seeing this, maybe the most straightforward way of interpreting this linear constraint, is in terms of gauge invariance. Simply, this constraint, constraint does not hold, didn't hold, the Lagrangian would not be gauge invariant here. You can see this because one of these constraints was uh, the one found by the Dick Lowers and McGruyen in the electric frame. You remember X, lambda, sigma, gamma, total part, total symmetric part equals to zero. And this was the constraint that they derived in order for the, the Lagrangian to be 
aging patterns. So not from supersymmetry, but from aging patterns of the action. And indeed, if you compute the, the variation of the bosonic action and the gay genetic age transformation, you see that it's going to be proportional to this uh, symmetric part. Totally symmetric part. So it's, uh, it vanishes, provided this totally symmetric part is So we have these two different interpretations. Supersymmetry variance, gauge variance, but the two are not independent. We know, because supersymmetry closes, as Sam was mentioned yesterday, closes on the local symmetries of the theory, which include gauge symmetries. So if the theory were not gauge invariant, it would, not even, it would also not be supersymmetry. Okay? So these two things are, are related to one another. Okay? Okay. So let's briefly mention how. Uh, okay. Yes. Let us briefly mention um, how this uh, embedding tensor enters the variation, the supersymmetry variation of the reaction. Okay. It enters to, through a, another tensor, which is called the T tensor. Which we are now going to define. We consider now a theory which is described in which the scalar sector is described by a homogeneous, possibly symmetric, scalar value. So M scalar is <coughs> what you range. Although what I'm saying can also be ex extended to a non-homogeneous uh, case, which occurs for any can occur only for any now, uh, we have seen that uh, each point, P, in this manifold is in one-to-one -one correspondence with a uh, corset, a left corset, okay? And picking a representative of the corset means choosing a parametrization. So, we choose a corset representative that is a parametrization, which is in one-to-one -one correspondence with our point. Well, modulo the action, the right action of a uh, the group H, the, the isotropy group H, okay? Uh, P of phi. So phi are the coordinates labeling uh, uh, the point P, the generic point, okay? Now, LP, our cosine represents R. We have seen also that for any G in G, G times L of phi is equal to the coset representative in the transformed point phi prime times a compensating transformation, which depends on G and phi. It's local. Local in the scale in the in the manifold. Uh, okay, local in the um, on the scale element. And the Fermi field is transformed under this. Okay. So we can consider the representation R1 of L of phi because L of phi is an element of G. So we can represent it in uh, its action on the electric fields and their magnetic tools through the representation R1. Okay, and what we end up with is a matrix. Okay, so we can define this matrix here. The first index is acted on by G. The second index is acted on by H. Okay. Since it is acted on by G from the left and by H 
on the right, naturally intertwines between bosonic fields and fermionic fields. Since the fermions transform under H, and the bosons and their derivatives transform under G, okay? The second index of uh, L can contract with the fermionic linears, for instance, and the first one can contract with the bosons, okay? So, because the representative is the object which intertwines between the two things, fermions which only transform under H, and uh, bosons which only transform under G, and allows us to construct couplings which are G-invariant. They are constructed like this, G-invariant couplings. Okay? Are there any questions? object here, which is, uh, consists of the bosonic fields, their derivatives, dressed with uh, uh, embedding tensor, as uh, an object which I call uh, F of bosons and uh, D bosons, which you can see transforms <coughs> under H, because it's free index now, it's the second index of the embedding tensor, which transforms under H. This is called composite, composite. An, exam an example of composite field are, fields are um, the center charges. Center charges are electric and magnetic charges, okay, which transform, naturally transform under G, dressed by the embedding, the, the cosset representative. And they transform under uh, under H the composite transformation. The T tensor that we are now, now going to define is an object of this kind. It's uh, defined by dressing the, the embedding tensor which formally transforms under G by means of the causal representative, so that the object we obtain is an H object, namely it transforms under uh, the group H. And therefore, using this object, contacting this object with fermion with bilinears, which do transform, transform uh, by H, we can construct invariant. G invariant. Okay? the D tensor. This is T and function of scalar fields and theta. And this is obtained by dressing uh, the embedding tensor by means of a positive representative. <coughs> so this is obtained by acting by means of L of phi on our very tensor theta. How? Well, the embedding tensor has two indices, so I have to act by means of phi, a value of phi, on the two indices. Sorry, L minus 1. This is L minus 1 and, and theta m alpha, okay? And this is the action of L on the first index. Then you have to act on the second index because it has to have be a simultaneous action on the two indices. On the second index, you see, it acts like this. Okay? And 
this is T and B. Okay. So we have defined a tensor which has the same index structure as theta and then and a beta. But which transforms under the compensating transformation because it is obtained by from theta by dressing theta by means of the event of the positive process. Okay? Let's prove that it transforms like this. So let us write T theta pi theta schematically as L minus 1 times this is a symbolic way of, the, of uh, writing this. L minus 1 in the representation of theta acting on theta. To be precise, we should write R of theta of L minus 1 times theta. Okay? To be precise. But let's be sorry and write just like that. It just as L minus 1. Let us show that under a generic transformation in G, this T transforms as a composite field, so through the compensating transformation. And so it can be used to, to, to couple, to construct terms defining couplings between uh, uh, scalar fields of bosons and fermions. Take G G. G L phi is equal to L phi prime times h, which depends on phi g, okay? Okay. Uh, where phi goes into g, into phi prime, which is an a nonlinear function of phi, okay? And the theta transforms in g times theta. Well, I should write r, r theta of g. Okay? But then it's not okay, I just write it like this, in a symbolic way. This means action of G on theta. I know how to write it. By means of G on theta. Okay? So how does T transform? T of phi prime theta prime. This is equal to L minus 1 phi prime times theta prime. Now I read L minus 1 phi prime here in terms of L of phi. And what this is is uh, um, H L minus 1 of phi times G minus 1, okay, times theta prime, which is G of phi, G of phi, okay? Now you see that these two cancel out. And we are left with H times N minus 1 phi times T. That is H times T of phi. So this is an example of the composite field I was talking about. This is a clear example. If I transform both phi and theta, it transforms by the compensating transformation. So if I transform both phi and theta at the same time, it transforms as an H tensor. H tensor. It transforms as an H tensor. And so I can use it to, to I can contract it with the fermion bilinear to construct H in binary components. Okay? And therefore, this is uh, needed to uh, construct uh, uh, terms in the Lagrangian depending on the metric tensor, which are manifestly invariant under H transformations. Okay? Okay. okay. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, yes. So, R symmetry is an example of composite uh, field. R symmetry. R, R symmetry is part of G of H. Okay. So, R symmetry is a, is a group. A composite field is made of uh, uh, bosons 
and derivative of bosons, okay, dressed with um, the cosine representative. So that uh, uh, it transforms under uh, age, and in particular under, as you say, the R symmetry group. But the R symmetry group is not by itself a composite group. I give another example of composite group, which, uh, which are addressed uh, field strengths. These are also important in supergravity. So we have our F M nu, which depend only on uh, on the vector fields. Okay, these are all, uh, these are our electric magnetic vector of electric magnetic uh, field strengths. Okay, they trans it transforms under G. We know in the representation of R one. Okay, but I can construct. I can construct now. Um, how to denote them? Um, well, let's denote them by T, but not to confuse it with the T test, okay? So T is the double line here, okay? Let's define this function of phi and, uh, and the vector fields. The derivatives to be L M M under score, okay, times F M, okay. This depends on phi, and this is uh, our user. So I'm dressing vector of electric field strengths and their magnetic dual by means of L. I write uh, this index uh, with a uh, underline Y because uh, to emphasize that this index is acted on by H. It's the left, the right index of the positive group. Okay? Now, this can be written as formally L minus 1 of phi acting on F. And why? Well, because you see, uh, this matrix defines the action on provided objects. Okay, so F would transform with an n minus one. This is the, the usual thing. So you can easily verify that under any G in G, this T of phi prime uh, a prime this is equal to L minus 1 phi prime times F prime we will play the same trick here okay this is H times H times um, L of phi times G minus 1 times G F is to cancel. So this is H times T of G by A. So you see, if we transform both phi and A, what I have end up with is a, a transformation. Okay. So it happens precisely the same way. This tends to be particularly uh, important in ungauged theories. There's no embedding tensor here because it defines the central charges. The central charges in a black hole solution, they are composite objects depending on the electric and magnetic charges and on phi. These are defined as the integral of, of a, a, an S2, at infinity, of this object N. Okay? And they characterize physical properties 
of a, a for instance, black hole solution at radial infinity. Okay. Now, why did we? Uh, how much time do we have? Uh, I'm telling you, it's over now. Okay. Okay. So I think we can make a break, okay. and then. Uh, okay.